Afterwards, we'll have Brother Rogers open our meeting with prayer. Pretty good. you at the start of this meeting to always give honor and praise and thanks to you and to ask for your spirit to be uh, with our meeting and be with those that have prepared parts. We look forward for a fine interchange of encouragement. Uh, we pray on behalf of those that are listening in by telephone that cannot be with us at this particular time. We pray for their speedy recovery. We also want to pray for our worldwide association of brothers, especially those that uh, in countries where our work is banned, they do not have the freedom to meet openly uh, on property and come to a beautiful kingdom hall and worship you. We also want to keep in mind our brothers that are dealing with natural disasters in various parts of the world as, as well. So we ask all of this, Jehovah, at this time, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, welcome, everyone, to the midweek meeting this week. We look forward to many encouraging talks tonight, and we're going to be looking at a couple videos. So in our first part, we're going to be talking about a priest forever in the manner of Melchizedek. We're going to see how Jesus Christ fulfilled that role, our digging for spiritual gems, we're going to really focus on the second one. How did the law covenant become obsolete in Jeremiah's day? So think about that one uh, as we go through that part. Uh, Brother McCullough will be doing our Bible reading tonight in the book of Hebrews. Uh, apply yourself to reading and teaching. We're going to be talking about a new council point tonight, proper use or appropriate use of visual aids. And that's uh, going to be for 10 minutes. We'll talk about that have an audience discussion. We're going to have a five-minute talk. Brother Jason O'Doy will give us a five-minute talk. What is the New Covenant? In our Living as Christians portion of our meeting, we're going to watch a video, Organizational Accomplishments. Brother Jay Marin will be handling that part for us. And then in our Congregation Bible Study, Jesus Ministry in Perea is going to be discussed tonight. So we look forward to a very fine, upbuilding, encouraging meeting. So let's start with our first uh, part tonight. Treasures from God's Word, Brother Jamal Cunningham, will give us the talk, A Priest Forever in the Manner of Melchizedek, Brother Cunningham. A 
a priest forever in the manner of Melchizedek. Now we know in this title, the priest is referred to as Jesus Christ himself. But let's find out who Melchizedek was, how he's associated with Jesus Christ, and where he came from. Let's open our Bibles and read Hebrews 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And Abram gave, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name is translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, that is king of peace. Now, in the scriptures, Melchizedek is the first priest mentioned in the Bible, and he ruled over Salem, so he held two offices, that is king and priest. And the meaning of the kingdom that he ruled, Salem, meant peace. And the meaning and definition of Melchizedek's name was king of righteousness. And that's why it was fitting for Paul to refer to him as a king of peace and a king of righteousness. So where was Salem? Salem was understood to be the nucleus of Jerusalem. So it was the center or the core or the heart of Jerusalem before Jerusalem even came into existence. As a matter of fact, Salem is incorporated in the word Jerusalem, where you get Jeru-Salem. So that right there tells us where the location of Salem had to be. And we know the prophetic things that took place in Jerusalem. But just imagine you were Abraham. And after you have rescued your nephew Lot and all of his family, and you slaughtered kings to rescue your nephew, and all of a sudden, on the low plane of the kings comes the king of peace and the king of righteousness, and he comes out to bless you and to feed you bread and good wine. Just to think how Abraham must have felt. It had to feel like Jehovah himself was feeding him. What consolation or confirmation and confidence Abraham must have felt from King Melchizedek, Jehovah's anointed priest, and he was a king. So where did Melchizedek come from? Let's read Hebrews 7 and verse 3. It says, And being fatherless, motherless, without genealogy, having neither a beginning of days nor an end of life, but being made like the Son of God, he remained a priest for all time. So the scriptures contain no information of Melchizedek's genealogy. So it doesn't mention that he had a beginning of his reign or an end of his life. So there's no mention of his parents. But we do know that Melchizedek was human and he was fleshly because he went out to meet Abraham. But because none of this was mentioned, you can in turn say that he ruled or his priestlyhood never ended. Also, during time, there was no Meshelidex or Melchizedek Juniors running around claiming that they were associated with this king or priest. And that's how you can make the connection and why Melchizedek was a fitting foreshadow of Jesus coming. Also, you have to keep in mind that because there was no beginning or end, there was no predecessor or no, nor no successor to the throne. The same with Jesus Christ. There will not be anyone to succeed 
Jesus Christ. Let's read Hebrews 7, verse 17. It says, For it is said in witness of him, You are a priest forever in the manner of Melchizedek. So when we go to our life and ministry, we see two pictures. Let's focus on the one at the bottom. But first, let's ask this question. How was Melchizedek a prophetic type of Jesus? Well, keep in mind that Melchizedek didn't have a genealogy, but Jesus did when it came to his kingship. So you can trace Jesus' uh, kingdom lineage back to the tribe of Judah and through the line of King David. But when it came to his priesthood, there was no inheritance such as from Aaron or the line of the Levites. Why? It's because he was chosen and made an oath by Jehovah to be a high priest, the same as Melchizedek. So there was no fleshly lineage. Now, at the bottom of our picture, we can see a priest. And the question is, how is Christ's priesthood superior to the Aaronic priesthood? Well, like Mel. Like Jesus, Melchizedek did not inherit his priesthood by fleshly descent. Rather, it was by appointment from Jehovah himself that Jesus and Melchizedek became priests. So we see that no one could be superior to Jesus' priestlyhood because he is reigning in heaven next to his father, Jesus. Unlike Aaron... He came from a line of descent, and his descent was passed on to the Levites. And all those that were to become priests had to come through this line, except two, Melchizedek and Jesus. They were made priests by Jehovah himself. So that brings us to the question, how do we benefit? And what can we take from this lesson of Melchizedek and Jesus Christ. Well, if you look at our image, here you have Jesus Christ on the throne. So who would you like sitting in that seat? Unlike worldly governments, most people vote for a person that cunningly tells them things that they feel draws them to that person someone that they feel can relate to them. No one can relate to us better than Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ, as a priest, gave the ultimate sacrifice, his perfect life. Also, we have a king and priest that can sympathize us. See, as a fleshly human, Jesus touched a leper, compassionately, who had not had human contact for many years. That says a lot about the king and priest that's sitting on that throne. Not only that, he resurrected the dead, he healed the sick, and he also cried. Now, that should bring us joy and comfort, because who better qualified in Jesus Christ, a person, a spirit creature now who's reigning king next to Jehovah God that shows that kind of love for all his subjects. When you go back to thinking of the definition of Salem and the definition of Melchizedek, see, Jesus' rule will never cease to exist. So in turn, we can say, under his kingdom rule, we will always be in a kingdom of peace and also a kingdom of righteousness that will eliminate all mankind's problems. So even though the scriptures are prophetic and we witness prophecies being fulfilled, they have a direct effect on us 
And it's very important that we understand Jehovah's arrangement because it benefits us. And that's how we learn more about the prophecies and what Jesus and Jehovah have in store for us. Thank you, Brother Cunningham, for showing us how Jesus Christ is a priest forever in the manner of Melchizedek. So we, we thank you for showing us how it applies to us and applies in the future. Thank you once again. Well, let's now consider our Digging for Spiritual Gems. We've asked Brother Russ Compton to do the Digging for Spiritual Gems tonight, and I don't see him anywhere. Mm -hmm. Can you give me my iPad, Stephanie? Where? Digging for Spiritual Gems. So this is your chance for the audience to participate by question and answer. So let's start off by getting a reader for Hebrews 8, verse 3. Who would like to read that for us? Let's get Sister Crochet, please. Hebrews 8, verse 3, and then we'll ask a question. To have something to offer. Okay, good. So the question is, what was the difference between gifts and sacrifices offered under the Mosaic Law? And we have a reference of a 2,000 watchtower you can take your information from. Uh, Brother John Marin? Well, gifts were given uh, because one feels generous. And so it's a free gift, and Jehovah has given us many free gifts. We we don't have to pay back, but a sacrifice is, you might say, mandatory in order to to make atonement for something, and uh, some and it, it's it's a, a burden that we has to be carried out by the individual that commits itself. It's like a vow. It's a it's it's necessary to be fulfilled. So that's what a sacrifice does. Okay, thank you. And Brother Thompson, please, in the back. I like this uh, profound statement that uh, people generally give gifts to express affection and appreciation as well as to cultivate friendship, favor, and symptoms. So similarly, it's that like uh, many people prescribed by the law can be viewed as gifts to God to seek his acceptance and favor. So sometimes people are looking for something, and Jehovah gives us generously. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sister Wyrick, please, and then Brother San Luis. And we see how transgression of the law required restitution, and to make amends, sacrifices for sins were offered. Okay, thank you. Brother San Luis? I was just thinking about how to apply that into my life, and I was thinking how in the ministry we're required to go out in the ministry. But the amount of time that we put in and the quality of our ministry, those are gifts that we give to Jehovah. And, of course, we want to give him the, ben the very best of that. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the second question. This is the one we're going to focus on tonight. How? Uh, first of all, before we ask the second question, uh, we need Hebrews 8.13. Or did I ask that to be read first? Because it's supposed to be Hebrews 8.3. But now we need Hebrews 8.13 read. I'd like to read that for us. Sister... Uh, Sister um, Goodman, please. Hebrews 8.13. In his saying, a new covenant, he has made the former one obsolete. Now what is obsolete and growing old is near to vanishing away. Okay, thank you. So the question is, how did the law covenant become obsolete in Jeremiah's day? Uh, Sister Gladys O'Doy? Well, Jehovah revealed to Jeremiah that he was going to cancel the um, oath of the law covenant, and that was the, that was um, the one that he had made with their forefathers, so it was going to be different than that one. So in 33 CE, when Jesus died on the torture stake, it canceled the old um, covenant, and the new one was replaced. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Thomas, please. At a... Uh... First Timothy chapter two and verse five and six it talks about Jesus Christ being the mediator between uh God and man. So he was the mediator of 
the new covenant. See, he was the Christ of that, that new covenant arrangement. But uh, Moses, he was the Christ of the old covenant arrangement. That's the Mosaic Law covenant with his over 600 and uh, so, so laws. But see, under that new arrangement, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, he's king and, and also high priest of that arrangement. He brings benefits to all those that's under that arrangement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sister Diamato, then Brother John Marin. Yeah, under the law covenant, there were many written laws. I can't remember exactly. I believe it was over 600. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. However, under the new covenant, that would be something that would be written on our hearts. So uh, diff- also different in, in that sense. Okay, thank you. Brother John Marin. Jehovah knew when he made the, gave the first prophecy about a seed that there would be a new arrangement coming in. And he, prophetically, he told Jeremiah there that there would be a new covenant. And that was as good as done. Just like he said, told Adam and Eve they were going to die, it was as good as done. Mm-hmm. On the time he pronounced it. So there was going to be a new covenant. And that mm-hmm. made the old one obsolete. Exactly. Very good. I'll read you the simple answer here. One sentence. Jehovah's announcement of a better covenant made the covenant it would replace, in a sense, obsolete. In 33 CE, God brought the Mosaic Law covenant to an end. So uh, so there's the new covenant, and it was actually, even though it's still in place, it became, quote, obsolete during Jeremiah's day. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, what has this week's Bible reading taught you about Jehovah? The book of Hebrews, Paul gives us some good counsel there. There's several things that teach us about Jehovah. Brother Albon in the back. So one thing is interesting. So all of the Jews, well, not all of them, but most of them, they were expecting this Jewish system of things to last forever. Meanwhile, they had not been paying attention to the scriptures because several times Jehovah said, well, this is a temporary arrangement, either by demonstrating it or outright saying so. So, uh, that just goes to show we ought to pay close attention to the scriptures, and that way uh, when something new comes along, then we can know, oh, that's what Jehovah meant back when he said this or this happened, that he did this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother San Luis. I was thinking about his loving kindness, because here we have the Hebrew Christians who some of them were still ascribing to the law covenant. And so through a very logical explanation, Paul, through Jehovah, corrected them and explained to them why this is no longer valid. And so I'm just thinking today, too, we get corrections, uh, you know, like Brother Albon mentioned, but Jehovah does that lovingly, kindly to correct our thinking. And uh, it behooves us to actually pay attention to that, because probably the next time the stick will come. Okay, thank you. And then our final question, what other spiritual gems have you discovered in this week's Bible reading? Sister Chamberlain and then Brother Cruz. In Hebrews 7.25, it talks about how um, Jesus is able, able to save completely those who are approaching God through him because he's always alive to plead for them. So it shows here the um, how we can prove the, the Trinity um, is not being three in, in, in one because Jesus serves as a sympathetic in, intercessor in behalf of those who approach God and um, how he experienced life as a human and um, which able to enable him to appreciate for us to appreciate more fully how he suffered for others. So that's a good one that we could use out in the ministry. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Brother Cruz. I appreciated uh, chapter 8, verse 2, because uh, as men or as brothers here in the congregation or in our family, they may have a, a measure of responsibility or authority. But Jesus set a perfect example. He's described there as a minister or a public servant. So even though he had this very lofty position um, uh, and a high authority, he used his authority to give, not to take. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother David O'Doy in the back, please. I really appreciate it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, because there it shows that uh, 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 Jesus is the mediator of a correspondingly better covenant, which has been legally established on better promises. And so that shows that Jehovah is a God of laws, 
and that he establishes uh, everything that he does on solid legal foundations, which gives us confidence that he will always continue to be righteous. Very good. Thank you. I'm sorry we're out of time, so that's all the comments we'll take tonight. But uh, keep those in mind, and we'll be able to use those in our lives as we go along this week. Okay, so we're going to move on now to our Bible reading. We've asked Brother Zach McCullough to give us the Bible reading in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. So if you'd like to follow along. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name is translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. And being fatherless, motherless, without genealogy, having neither a beginning of days nor an end of life. But being made like the Son of God, he remains a priest for all time. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the family head, gave a tenth out of, it, out of the best spoils. True, according to the law, those of sons of Levi who received their priestly office have a commandment to collect tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, even though these are descendants of Abraham. But this man, who did not trace his genealogy from them, took tithes from Abraham and blessed them, <clears throat> and blessed the one who had promises. Now, it is undeniable that the lesser one is blessed by the greater, and in the one case, it is men who are dying who receive tithes. But on the other case, it is someone who, whom witness is given that he lives. And it could be said that even Levi, who receives tithes, has paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still a future descendant of the forefather when Melchizedek met him. If then perfection was attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for it was a feature of the law that was given to the people, what further need would there be for another priest to arise who is said to be in the manner of Melchizedek and not in the manner of Aaron? For since the priesthood is being changed, it becomes necessary to change the law as well. For the man... For the man about whom these things are said come from another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord has descended from Judah, yet Moses said nothing about priests coming from that tribe. And this becomes, becomes even clearer when another priest arises who is like Melchizedek, who, is, who has become such not by the legal requirement that depends on the fleshly descent, but by the power of the indestructible life. For it is said in a witness of him, you are a priest forever in the matter of Melchizedek. Okay, thank you very much, Brother McCullough. So study uh, point number five, accurate reading. So accurate reading is... Uh, one of the most important things we can do. In, in fact, a Bible reading is our chance to teach the congregation by our reading. So uh, you notice there's some things to do, like prepare well. So you must have went over it several times before you got up there. Uh, one of the things I noticed, though, is observe all punctuation marks. And I think the Apostle Paul probably uses more commas than any other writer. In fact, in the first three verses, 11 commas, so we really got to observe those and stop and pause. So you did a nice job of that, too. Uh, also, uh, it helps to, to listen to an audio recording of the publication. Now, everything we have is we're able to listen to virtually now. So that reading you can listen to before you even go up here. And when we listen to it, we 
are able to pronounce words like Melchizedek. Now, it looks like it's Melchizedek, but it's not because it's not English. It's a Hebrew word. So that CH is pronounced like a K. So Melchizedek. So you did a nice job of doing that, too. So uh, it's nice to hear it beforehand, and we can see how the brothers do it. So you did a very nice job of doing that, and we appreciate your fine effort tonight. Okay, let's move into the Apply Yourself to the Field Ministry portion of our meeting now. Now we're going to look at a new uh, video, uh, study number nine in the teaching brochure, the use of a visual aid. It's not just the use of them, but it's the appropriate use of them. So pay close attention to the video. How can you make important points of instruction more vivid as you teach? Use a visual aid. That's what Jehovah did when speaking with Abraham, as recorded in Genesis 15:5. Jehovah brought Abraham outside and said, Look up, please, to the heavens and count the stars. Imagine Abraham looking up to the heavens on a clear night and seeing thousands of stars twinkling like diamonds. Jehovah then made the point of instruction clear when he said, So your offspring will become. Abraham understood. And he remembered Jehovah's promise for the rest of his life. How might we use visual aids in our teaching? We can choose pictures, diagrams, maps, timelines, or other items to highlight not minor details, but important concepts. And whether we're teaching in the field ministry or in the congregation, we need to make sure that our listeners can see the visual aid. As we watch the following example, consider whether this use of a visual aid is appropriate or inappropriate. Rumors are like this balloon, full of hot air, floating through the room. What should we do with rumors? Deflate them before they travel any further. Was that an appropriate use of a visual aid? Oh, it'll be remembered, but for all the wrong reasons. Our objective in using visual aids is not to shock or entertain the audience. Let's give the speaker another chance to make appropriate use of a visual aid. Why should we spend time getting to know our brothers and sisters? Well, we could compare them to this beautiful rock called the geode. If we look past the surface imperfections and take the time to get to know our brothers and sisters, we may come to know their beautiful inner qualities, the secret person of the heart. Simple and clear. Our publications also use visual aids. How can we make good use of them in the ministry? Let's watch a brother conducting a Bible study. Does he make good use of the artwork? What will life be like in the coming paradise? In order to visualize what we just considered in paragraphs 17 through 23, notice the artwork on page 37. Nice, right? Let's move on to paragraph 24. The publisher briefly called attention to the illustration, but he could have made better use of it. While we don't need to focus on minor details in the picture, we should try to highlight key aspects of the artwork. Let's watch him try again. What will life be like in the coming paradise? In order to visualize what we'll consider in paragraphs 17 through 23, notice the artwork on page 37. What aspects of this scene are different from life in today's world? Everybody's happy. That's right. The whole earth will be a paradise. What else? Does anyone in this scene have glasses or a cane? No. Sickness and death will be gone too. What about war and violence? What do you see in the picture? Everybody's getting along. Even people of different races. Exactly. There will even be peace between humans and the animals. But you might be thinking, that's just too good to be true. 
Well, let's now consider the verses from the Bible that provide the basis for this picture. Would you please read paragraph 17? In this case, the publisher used the artwork to preview information to follow. We can also use the artwork to review key points. The important thing is for our listeners to remember the point of the visual aid. Brothers who conduct the Watchtower study and the Congregation Bible study should make good use of the visual aids that appear in the lesson. When we select visual aids that enhance our teaching rather than detract from it, we'll honor Jehovah and make important points of instruction memorable to our audience. Okay, so study point number nine, appropriate use of visual aids. So does everybody have access to that in their, on their devices? Uh, so what is a visual aid to be used for? Jadon? It's used to preview or get the point across. Yeah, very good. So uh, it's important that we use appropriate visual aids. Why was the first one with the balloon not that appropriate? Brother Thomas? Way, way to Brother Brazilian. It was just too shocking. It was too... Uh... It was too unnoticed. I mean, it's too quick, and, uh, and he, he didn't really present nothing. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Sister San Luis? And the friends will remember the visual aid more than they'll remember the point that he was trying to make. Very good. And if we're at the hall here giving a talk, it's important that uh, the brothers have them ready to go, right? Because have you, have you seen a brother trying to use visual aids and they're not coming up exactly right? kind of irritating the audience. So make sure that they're ready to go before we, we even get up here. And then when it comes to the ministry, uh, how can we use visual aids in the ministry? Mr. Becker? Well, the first thing that to remember is to show it to the a uh, householder, not to just refer to it and keep looking at it ourselves. But if you're using a device or a book or whatever, be sure to turn it toward the householder. Yeah, very good. And we got to make sure we have it ready to go right before we get up there. And my problem is the sound is always down, so i got to make sure the sound's up before I even get there. So get that all ready to go before you get up there to the, house, to the door. Uh, Josiah, please. On our tablets, we could always use pictures and diagrams and things like that. Yeah, we could. Uh, Brother Compton in the back, please. Yeah, we should have something specific in mind when we show that uh, an illustration, just like I mentioned in the one that we saw, uh, how he illustrated basically, uh, he asked him a question, basically, uh, what don't you see? And he said, uh, and he mentioned... The fact that, well, there was no uh, indication of sickness, of being blind, and no, and no one crippled. And then he mentioned uh, uh, also a key point, basically, about, uh, you know, was there any uh, crime or disturbance? No, everybody looked happy. So you want to have it to use specific points that's going to really help your teaching. Very good. Thank you. Sister Cunningham, please. Also, too, if we choose to use the video, we wouldn't want to talk through the video. We want the video to do the talking, and then afterwards we'll ask viewpoint questions to see what they got out of it. Yeah, very good. Uh, Brother Cruz, please. Also, uh, we want to try to avoid the tendency to explain the illustration at first. Rather, as it mentions here, ask them to comment on what they see, and then after they comment, we can add additional questions to make sure they got the point. Yeah, very good. I noticed the brother did that. He uh, asked what you didn't see, and then he asked what you do see. So he didn't put the words into the householder's mouth, and he made him think about it, because a lot of times we get what the picture means, but they really don't see what, how, what the connection is. So we want to make sure we ask those easy-to-answer questions. Okay, very good. Uh, Sister Chamberlain, one final one. And then in the end, we want to always consider the verses from the Bible to correlate uh, what we just showed in the picture to show that this will come true. Yeah, very good. So it's a nice picture sometimes, but we want to make sure we connect it to the Bible. This is 
uh, right from the Bible, so we want to make sure we do that. So very good. So that's one of our new uh, council points we'll be using in the near future, appropriate use of visual aids. Okay, let's uh, go into the last part of our Apply Yourself to the Field Ministry. We've asked Brother Jason O'Doy to give us the talk that's entitled, What is the New Covenant? Brother O'Doy. For many years, we have discussed the law covenant that Jehovah made with the Israelites. But then we also read about the new law covenant, uh, as we have in our Bible reading for this week. So just what exactly is the law covenant, the new law covenant? Well, let's let the Bible answer that for us. Please turn me in your Bibles to to Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 33. And let's see what Jehovah foretold regarding that new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 33 reads, Look, the days are coming, declares Jehovah, when I will make the house of Israel and the house of Judah a new covenant. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers on the day I took hold of their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke Although I was their true master, declares Jehovah, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Jehovah. I will put my law within them, and in their heart I will write it, and I will become their God, and they will become my people. So we see here that Jehovah decided to establish a new law covenant because of the Israelites' disobedience uh, to, to him. So how would this new law covenant be validated? Well, again, please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 22, verse 20, and let's see what Jesus Christ uh, foretold would happen at the Lord's evening meal. We have Luke 22, verse 20, and let's look at that B part there. It says, This cup means the new covenant by virtue of my blood, which is to be poured out in your behalf. So we see here that the new covenant uh, is made operative by the shed blood of Jesus Christ the value of which was uh, presented to Jehovah after Jesus was uh, resurrected to heaven. This took effect 50 days after he was resurrected and about 10 days after he ascended to heaven and was uh, receiving the Holy Spirit. He then poured out that Holy Spirit to the disciples that were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem. So who are the parties involved with this new covenant? Well, on one side you have Jehovah God, And on the other side, you have the Israel of God, or the 144,000 spirit-begotten sons uh, in union with Christ Jesus, who will be on the other side. So how are these ones called into the Israel of God? Well, when God selects an individual to uh, receive their heavenly calling, Jehovah brings that individual into this covenant uh, over Christ's sacrifice. Please turn me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, and let's get a better understanding of how that's done. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then it says, And I will no longer call their sins and their lawless deeds to mind. So as mediator of this new law covenant, Jesus helps them become Abraham's real seed. And because of the forgiveness of their sins, Jehovah declares them righteous. So once these 144,000 receive their heavenly calling, what are they going to be doing here on earth before they go to heaven? Well, note 1 Peter 2, verse 21, and that's right after Hebrews there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. And it says there, in fact, to this course you were called, because even Christ suffered for you, leaving for you a model to follow his steps closely. So these anointed ones will be following Jesus' life course, remaining faithful to Jehovah, even until death. So now that we understand why Jehovah needed to make a new law covenant, how it was validated, and who makes up that law covenant, what is the purpose of the covenant? 
Well, this covenant requires that it continues in operation until all the Israel of God have been resurrected to immortal life in heaven. They thus become the bride class of Christ who will rule with Jesus in heaven. And since the benefits of this covenant will be everlasting, it will be a covenant that will never be broken. All right, thank you very much, Brother Udoy. Uh, fine coverage of that material. Uh, you made it very clear, easy to follow, uh, like three basic points, and then ask questions, answer the questions. Nice, nice job of covering that. And you're working on study number seven, accurate and convincing. So it's kind of two different things. Accurate, we must be accurate if we want to convince somebody. Uh, we don't have to be accurate, but you can convince somebody if you're wrong, but it's easier to convince somebody if we're accurate. And what you used for your uh, for your source material was the Bible. So that's something we don't have to double check. We know it's accurate already. So a, a nice job of doing that. If we're going to use uh, secular sources for our, any information in our talks, got to make sure those are accurate because sometimes, you know, they're exaggerated, they're wrong. So we've got to really double check those. And... Uh, let's see. So then you you help the audience to reason on the evidence that we had. So that helps uh, to convince an audience if they're reasoning on something and they come to their own conclusions, then it's uh, you're more able to convince them that way. So nice job of doing that. And you ask tactful questions, like it says here in the in the study point. I know it's three tactful questions you asked. So very good. So the audience had to answer those to themselves, not out loud, but to themselves. So that's how they were able to get the point. So very nice job of doing that tonight, and we do look forward to your next next talk. Okay, so that's going to end our apply yourself to the field ministry portion of our meeting. So let's uh, begin our living as Christians by singing a song of praise to Jehovah. So if you can, everybody rise, and we're going to sing song number 124. And song number 124 is entitled, Ever Loyal. That's song number 124. talk about our organizational accomplishment video that we have every quarter, so it's that time again. So we've invited Brother Jay Marin to give us that part tonight. So our uh, video tonight on organizational accomplishments, it's about visiting Bethel. 
Have you ever thought about visiting Bethel? What we'd like to do is turn our attention to the monitors and let's see what we get out of this video. Have you ever visited Bethel, which means House of God? During one of our branch offices will give you a better understanding of how our work is organized. The Coordinators Committee of the Governing Body has made a number of arrangements for your visit to be enjoyable and instructive. Back in 2013, when the Governing Body announced that World Headquarters would be moving to Warwick, New York, we said the following. Well, once this is finally finished, uh, we're excited to welcome the brothers from around the world to come visit because we have some very nice surprises for you. Not just a beautiful surrounding, but some real spiritual treasures that you're going to enjoy when you get there. Now at World Headquarters in the United States, visitors can enjoy three museums at Warwick Bethel. Since the museums opened in March 2017, and through 2018, more than half a million people have visited the museums. On average, that's up to 1,200 people every day, Monday through Friday. With such a large operation, what does it take to welcome all of our visitors to our ever-changing museums and to help them to benefit from their visit? Let's find out. The museum department coordinates the ongoing operation of the museum. This involves tour scheduling, inviting and training tour attendants, welcoming and directing visitors from around the world, and maintaining the exhibits and audio devices. All of this work is done not only by full-time members of the Bethel family, but also by temporary workers, commuters, and remote volunteers. As you may know, the tours are self-guided, and audio devices are provided for that purpose. The devices recharge overnight, and depending on the language of the group, we program the language. We have 13 different languages, including American Sign Language. Once the audio devices are returned, we sanitize the audio devices and clean the lanyard. I really enjoy working here at Warwick. I count it as a great privilege to be able to meet and serve my brothers and sisters. But there's more behind the scenes, including a remote computer support team and a graphic art team. Our user experience team will create visual concepts for the interactive experiences for the visitors based on the content and the mood and the overall direction that we receive. Once that concept is approved, our development team will take that and turn those concepts into actual interactive programs. Design really begins when we get a theme for a new exhibit, then we get artifacts, and we really want to build around the artifacts. What really drives the design is a balance of teaching and art. As a designer, you would try to really enhance the teaching points so that people can walk away with information, but then using art to help them to feel something emotionally. Plenty of work also goes into artifact acquisition and conservation. Brothers around the world continue to donate rare and valuable Bibles and unique historical artifacts. Master craftsmen care for Bibles and rare artifacts, but they also train others to do so as well. Jehovah gave us a treasure to the Bible. In it, we found his promises, and he connected his name to it. These old Bibles in the museum tell us the story how the Bible came to us and how his name is preserved in it. There are so many artifacts and Bibles coming in that brothers and sisters need to be trained so that the Bibles can be restored and maintained. Restoring these Bibles makes it helpful for other branches that we can loan them for their benefit. As noted at 1 Chronicles 28:21, Jehovah provided willing, skilled workers to perform every kind of service when Solomon built the temple. Jehovah also has provided willing and skilled volunteers to build and maintain the museums. 
A comparable museum of similar size and quality would cost millions of dollars to build and operate yearly. The use of commuters and remote workers, whenever possible, has reduced expenses to a fraction of what that project would have cost otherwise. In addition to the three main museums, there are special exhibits. These exhibits are then sent to branches as part of an arrangement for developing and sharing exhibits and rare Bibles between branches. Months of planning go into each of these special exhibits. The coordinator's committee gave us direction on this display that was going to be about Russia, as well as the theme, We Will Not Give Up. The purpose was to tell the story of our brothers and sisters in Russia over the last 100 years and the outstanding example that they've given us, especially now in modern times with the increased opposition that they face. Research started back in April of 2017, and design started in earnest late that summer, and the goal was to have the exhibit up and running in time for annual meeting and dedication of that October. The exhibit was open for 10 months. In August of 2018, we carefully documented it, dismantled it, created it, and shipped it to Central Europe where it was going to be set up. And in the meantime, research and design had started for the Courage exhibit, which was going to replace it and be open for that annual meeting. World Headquarters provides direction to branches worldwide as they develop their exhibits. For example, content for exhibits at branches is reviewed by the museum department in Warwick prior to final approval. When a branch wants an exhibit, the branch writes the coordinators committee, and if the coordinators committee agrees that an exhibit should be developed, then we work with the publishing committee to get approval to use the space as well as a budget for the project. We're finding that there are basically just four types of exhibits that we use. That is a Bible exhibit, a theocratic history exhibit, an exhibit that talks about Bethel operations, and sometimes special theme or rotating exhibits. Each application of those four types is customized to reflect the local branch flavor. The room here in Selters has a floor plan that is different from the one in Warwick. Therefore, the exhibition had to be fitted accordingly. We had to build new walls and had to arrange the exhibit in a different way. Thanks to the help and the experience of our brothers from the museum department, the original style of the exhibition could be maintained. We were happy to see the enthusiasm with which the project was supported, and at the end of two weeks, everything was set up. Although the exhibition is not very large, it makes a deep impression on the visitors, and they feel even more connected to their brothers in Russia. By the end of 2018, over 35 branches had received assistance with the planning of their new exhibits. These branches receive more than 500,000 visitors annually. What's being done to enhance the exhibits in the branches? Because artifacts are the essential feature of these displays, we work together with Ward Headquarters Computer Department to develop a global searchable catalog. Branches can use this global catalog to see information about the artifacts, such as photographs, detailed descriptions, availability information, as well as what location that artifact may be in, so that they can loan those artifacts and complete their exhibits. To help conserve and preserve the artifacts, we help branches set the appropriate lighting levels for their exhibits. We also assist with displays, projections, and in some cases, interactive touchscreens and directional audio to really create an immersive experience for the visitors. The artifacts within our collection are donated by brothers and sisters, congregations, assembly halls, Bethel family members, and even on occasion, non-witnesses from all over the world. They can choose to donate them as an outright gift to us or as a loan for a special exhibit. Unfortunately, not all items are accepted into the Warwick Museum. When an offer is provided to us, we look at the rarity, the significance, the language of the item. We also look at the impression that it will bring upon a visitor. This will allow us to see if it can be included in the Warwick Museum or into other branch museums that are taking place. Do you have an item of historical significance that you'd like to make available? Feel free to write to the museum department at Warwick. The item might just find a home in one of our museums around the world.
The governing body warmly invites you to visit your local branch office and, if your circumstances allow, the world headquarters in the United States. We trust that your visit will be instructive and will strengthen your faith that Jehovah is guiding and directing his people during these last days. Afterwards, we'll have Brother Rogers open our meeting with prayer.